Well, let me tell you a little background before I share this message, okay? A number of years ago, I went to a pastor's conference, and this was many years ago. And Pastor Osteen, John Osteen, was still alive before he passed away. In fact, it was one of the last conferences he ever conducted. And he told a group of pastors, he said, let me tell you the greatest day in my ministry. It was when I quit preaching sermons, and I just started ministering messages. In other words, I quit trying to put together a fancy sermon. I thought, I just want to help people in things that God has burned into my spirit. I just want to take what God has spoken to me and share it into other people's lives. So, I would say about two weeks ago, I was spending time just praying, seeking the Lord, going through a number of scriptures, actually praying the prayers of Paul one morning. And I was just reading through these scriptures, reading through these scriptures. And when I saw over there in Ephesians, when Paul said the spirit of wisdom and revelation, just like that word revelation, it just like spoke to me. I knew the Lord was dealing with me and he was wanting to talk to me just on that phrase, revelation. And so I found myself just meditating on that even at night, you know, waking up in the middle of the night, just thinking about that word revelation, revelation. And thinking, how does all this tie in? And I knew in the Old Testament, you remember in the Old Testament whenever Moses had the encounter with the Lord, the burning bush experience. And, you know, Moses began to ask the Lord, well, Lord, when I go and I represent you to the Pharaoh and they ask me what your name is, what is your name? And if you'll know there that he gave them just really, it's what we know as Yahweh, but of course in the original it was just four consonants, uh, Y-H-W-H. And so it was like he just got this, this kind of a mystical name, uh, Yahweh as we know it. And then later in the New Testament we have the word Jehovah is what we have from in English in the New Testament. That's a counterpart to that. But the idea here is that who are you and what's your name? Well, my name's Yahweh. Well, when you look up Yahweh, most commentators agree on this, and it's the picture of a God who is a self-revealing God. So he's a God that wants to reveal himself. So to each one of us in this room, he's really out revealing himself to people. So everybody that one day stands before, for example, the great white throne judgment. And the great white throne judgment is for those that have never acknowledged Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I believe one of the things that they will see is just a recap of their life. And the Lord will show himself to them and God will reveal himself to them. And I believe they'll see time and time again that Jehovah, Yahweh, was trying to reveal himself to them. And we talked Sunday morning about how that, you know, creation declares the glory of God. The glory, uh, the heavens declare the glories of God. And how that through creation and through conscience, God reveals himself to people. And then through Christ, he revealed himself to people. So, you know, this is kind of part two of what we spoke on Sunday morning, but I'm going to give you a little more background. But it's the whole idea that the Christmas story is really a picture when God was wanting to reveal himself to people and God is still wanting to reveal himself now personally I find it kind of fascinating that people all over the world they uh, sing these Christmas carols and they may be atheist or agnostic but they sing these carols and they ask them why and they go well they kind of bring a strange peace on the crowd or when you sing these songs you know they just have a, a positive impact on people's lives and I think that, you know, you go into countries like uh, in Europe where there's, you know, a lot of atheism and a lot of agnostics, but yet they still have the nativity scene. They're, they're more, <laughs> there's more nativity scenes over there than there are in public property over here. You know, in other words, you just see that they are still drawn in a sense to just the fact that what happened was at the Christmas story, is that there was a extension of God reaching demand. So what is the Christmas story? And how does it relate to us today? It's really a picture of God wanting to reveal himself. Now, why did Jesus come to this earth? Why did Jesus, why was he born? He was born that we would see Emmanuel, and Emmanuel means God is with us. And so if you want to know what, what God is like, look at Jesus. 
And when you go through the Gospels, you got to remember that in John 10, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. So when you saw Jesus in motion, you saw God in motion. And if you wanted to know what God was like, you would realize he is the exact representation of the Father. He never did anything. He said, I will not do anything except what I see my Father do. So there was a perfect harmony that existed between the Son and the Father. So one of the reasons we celebrate the Christmas story is that we celebrate it because God was revealing himself to mankind. And what better way for God to reveal himself to mankind other than in his son, Jesus Christ, who was and is the exact representation of the Father who's here on the earth. So if you want to know what God felt about sickness, look at Jesus. Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. In Matthew 9, Jesus healed all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. So if you want to know what God's attitude is about any particular topic or any particular you know, malady that humanity deals with, you just look at Jesus because Jesus came to reveal the Father to us. What's Christmas all about and why do we celebrate it? it because the world has a picture of, of what God is like, because see, his name is Emmanuel, which means God is actually with us. Now, right now, in my devotional time, I'm going through the Gospel of Luke. And I read about whenever Jesus went into this Pharisee's house. And just the statement, whenever it says, Jesus went into the house of Simon, who was a Pharisee. And I thought to myself, now, is that not wild that God would go into somebody's home? And just that whole idea, God in the flesh, Jesus, went into the home of a person. And, of course, you know, while he was there, a lady came and, you know, she anointed his feet and she poured out the alabaster box. And, you know, Simon kind of took issue with that. If he was really a prophet, he would know what kind of lady this is. And then Jesus gave the illustration about, you know, if you had two people and one was forgiven of 500 denarii and the other one was forgiven of 50 who would be more grateful the one that had been forgiven the 500 or the one forgiven the 50 who who do you think simon would be more appreciative and it's like well sure the one that had been forgiven the 500 and he said those that have been forgiven much are the ones that love me a lot and so you know using the illustration that this lady had been forgiven much and so she loved me a lot well, I don't know, just that whole idea that Jesus went into somebody's home. And it's more than just Jesus. It's God went into a home. Well, if you think about it, that's exactly what happened when Jesus came to this earth. It was more than just, you know, a babe, but it was God in the flesh. It was God here in the earth. So we went through on Sunday and we kind of recapped the Christmas story and we read about God's visitation and how God revealed himself to Joseph. And I'm going to recap, and then we'll move into some other areas. But you think about in Matthew chapter 1, whenever, you know, Joseph had these honest questions. Mary comes to him, says, I'm pregnant. You know, angel has appeared to me and told me all these things. And Joseph, you know, she got a word from the Lord, but Joseph needed to hear from the Lord on this matter. And uh, the Bible says here in Matthew chapter 1 in verse number 18, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way, that when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And this is verse 19. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. And as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So the thing I want to say, just to reiterate, number one, Joseph had honest questions, and he needed God to reveal himself, show me, Yahweh, Jehovah, the Lord who is the self-revealing one, I need you to help me to see what I'm supposed to do. And you know, at that moment in time, God opened up his understanding. God brought an angel to him and told him what he needed to do. And I want to say this to each one of us tonight. There are going to be times in your life when you go, Lord, 
I need to know what I'm supposed to do. And I have good news. We serve the same God that Joseph did. Amen. We have the same God of Moses, the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is a self-revealing God, and he wants to reveal to us his will. He doesn't want us to live in a sense like in the dark, but he wants us to live in the light. In fact, he delivered us out of a kingdom of darkness, and he translated us over into the kingdom of his dear son. And so, you know, he's trying to process all this, Joseph was, but one of the things the Lord did immediately was he took him to the scripture, verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And Joseph woke from sleep and did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him. And he took his wife, and he knew her not, until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So that's the first way we see that this God, Yahweh, reveals himself. Now tonight, did you know God, there's some area of your life, let me put it this way. There is some area of your life that God is seeking to reveal himself to you in. Once you quit clapping and shouting, I'm going to go ahead and go. All right? There is some area of your life that God is endeavoring to get information over to you. And so what we need to do is we need to be uh, attentive to him. Remember Proverbs chapter 4, it says, My son, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. That means you need to listen to me. You need to be alert to me. You know, we were at our house the other night with some friends, and while we were all sitting at the table, the kitchen table, all of a sudden, one of these earthquakes took place. And it was, it was a Sunday night, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the table starts kind of shaking. And, you know, we have this earthquake uh, detection device at our house, and it's these little uh, sconces on the wall that have these little statues. <laughs> and anytime we think there's an earthquake, we always run into the living room, and we look at these sconces, and if they're shaking, we go, yeah, it's an earthquake, it's an earthquake. Yeah. And sure enough, you know, I made a beeline out of the kitchen, and I went in the living room, and I see the, the, um, the little statue shaking on the sconces. And I realized, okay, yeah, it's an earthquake. It's not just a helicopter or something. Yeah, there's something going on here. Now, what I want to say to you is this. You know, when God speaks to us, in the Old Testament, remember, they thought God was going to speak through the earthquake or God's going to speak through the storm. God's going to speak through the fire falling out of the sky. God's going to speak in these things. But God was not in any of that. But God came, hear this, in a still, small voice. And so what we've got to recognize when God's trying to reveal himself to us and God is revealing himself to us, it may come in the way of a dream in the night like Joseph had. I don't know about you, but I've discovered many times when God's communicating to me, it's not quite as spectacular, but it's still supernatural. It may not be quite as over the top, but yet it's still God speaking to us. So tonight, there's some information God's trying to get over to you. There's some helpful information that God is trying to bring into each of our lives. And what we've got to do is realize the Christmas story really is a story about God revealing himself. Yahweh wanting to show himself. And you know what I think we do? I think whenever we're in a receptive mode, you say, Pastor, what's the significance of lifting up your hands in worship? I think it's a, a picture of a receptive life. I think it's a picture of a, a d not dealing with all the distractions of earth, but it's setting your focus and your gaze upon the Lord so that you can hear from him. So then you go into this second chapter. In the second chapter of the book of Matthew, you have the visit of the wise men. And the Bible says, Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born, king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. 
and assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, In you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, and from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So as you read on through this story, you realize that these wise men, I know it's referred to, you know, we call them wise men. They were magi, different translations will say. They were astronomers. They were men, really, that studied the constellations. And many believe that they were men that had been influenced by uh, the teaching of Daniel many hundreds of years previous to this over in Babylon. And here they had heard a prophetic word about a star and a Christ child and that there would be a sign supernaturally, and it would be a revelation to them. So it's a picture of God revealing himself even to pagan people, people that were not of uh, you know, Jewish people, not of that background, Hebrew people. God was revealing himself. And so the thing I want to get across to you again tonight is this. God is revealing himself to people pagan people pagan people you know what I mean by pagan people that means lost people that means people that are maybe God's not even on their radar but that's not keeping God from reaching out to them and so we see the Lord revealing himself to Joseph we see the Lord revealing himself to these people of, of you know they were not from the traditional background people that would seek the Lord. So, you know, we need to pray for people, and we do, and we pray God bring labors into people's lives. We pray God speak into people's lives. Let me tell you, God loves everybody. For God so loved the world, all the people in the world. Now you say, Pastor, how, who do I need to love? What people on this earth do I need to love? Now, I'm going to give you a little idea here, and this will help you. Okay, I'm going to tell you. Here's how it works. If God loves them, you need to love them. Okay, I'm going to run that by you again, because some of you didn't get that, all right? Here's how it works. Now, Pastor, what measuring stick, what, what do I need to use to kind of quantify and to determine if I need to love that person. Now, here's, here's the measuring stick. If God loves them, you need to love them. And here's the good news. God loves everybody. He doesn't agree with everybody. He doesn't condone everybody. You know, he doesn't sanction everything everybody does. But having said all that, God loves everybody. And did you know he's already purchased their salvation? Did you know really he's not going to have to die another death? Jesus doesn't have to die another death for anybody's sin. Once and for all, he has made atonement. So we love everybody God loves. Now let me tell you, the meanest person around. You say, Pastor, let me ask you a question. The night... They announced that Osama bin Laden had been killed. Did you run out and dance in the street? You know, I didn't run out and dance in the street. Oh, pastor, you're not a patriot. If you were a real patriot, you would have run out and danced in the street. Well, no, how many know in the Old Testament, in the book of Ezekiel, it says God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So even when people are vile, even when people have done horrific things, they're still within the Lord. It's not like he's going, yeah, we finally got him. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. You see, God cares about everybody. Let me tell you, hell is a long, long time. It's forever. And see, God looks at people in the light of eternity, and he cares about them forever. So... God is revealing himself to people from pagan backgrounds. And you say, Pastor, how's he doing that? Through dreams and visions. I had a buddy of mine, he was raised in India. And he said he was a little boy, and he said in the home that I lived in, we'd get all these, like, lizards and reptiles, things would get in the house. 
And he said, I was really afraid one night. And he said, uh, because they, they would get in the house, snakes, things would get in the house. And he said, one night I had a dream and I saw Jesus and he spoke to me in my native Indian language and said, fear not, I'm with you. And he said, when I heard that, I never had that. That fear just left my life. And, of course, the first thought, I, I mean, I heard that story. I was amused. And I said, so you're telling me Jesus was speaking in the Indian language? He said, oh, yeah, perfect Indian language. Perfect Malayalam. Did you know God speaks perfect everything? And he's reaching out to people of Germany. He's reaching out to people in France. He's reaching out to per people in Canada. He's reaching out to people in Mexico. He's reaching out to people all over the place. And even people that aren't pursuing him, he's still pursuing them. Nobody will ever stand at the great white throne judgment and say, well, Lord, you never tried to reveal yourself to me. Now, here's what God wants to do. God wants to use us to help reveal the Father to people. You believe that? God wants to use you. You say, oh, yeah, Pastor, that's what your job is. Well, did you know my job really is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry? So my, my desire is to be a trainer to kind of equip to get people to where we're out revealing the Father to people. And so it's really important for us to, you know, do our job to help people to see how good God is and how God wants to heal people and God wants to bless people and God wants everybody to have eternal life and the Bible says he's not willing that anybody should perish, but that everybody should have eternal life. And then we go on and we read the story here about when they had departed, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Arise, take the child and his mother and flee into Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he arose and he took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. So we see here that in this Matthew account of the Christmas story that God was constantly revealing himself to mankind. And God is constantly revealing himself to us. He is. I remember one time I was, I was just a baby Christian. And I was praying about something. And I was going to go buy something one day, to buy, purchase something one day. And as I was going out, I just said, it was just one of those prayers. I mean, just, I love the Lord and I want to do what's right. And I was trying to make a decision. And I said, Lord, which one of those am I supposed to purchase? Which one of those am I supposed to buy? And I'm telling you, I heard the Lord say, neither. He said, neither. I thought, well, that's kind of weird. Neither. And I, I, I wish I could tell you I always obeyed the Lord, but I didn't. And I remember I went ahead and just bought some. And I remember that never worked out right. That purchase I made never seemed to work out right. And I still thought, sometimes we learn more from our mistakes than we do our successes in life. And in my mind, I remember for a long time thinking, now, isn't that interesting? I asked the Lord what I was supposed to do, and he revealed himself to me. And when I didn't get the answer I wanted. And, you know, sometimes God reveals himself to us, and because we don't get the answer we wanted, we, we're just going to kind of do our own thing. Well, do you understand, if you're going to ask, you need to acknowledge him in all your ways. But it's not enough to hear from the Lord. We've got to do what he tells us to do. Oh, I tell you, I was so blessed. Just reading Luke, as I said, I'm going through the Gospel of Luke, and just reading when Jesus gave kind of the Sermon on the Mount from Luke's perspective, and he talked just so clear that the wise man is going to be the one that hears my saying, and he does them. In other words, he hears what I tell him to do, and he turns around and does it. And if he'll do that, he'll build a foundation that'll stand through the storms of life. And you know, really, Christianity is summarized. What is the Lord telling you to do? Well, just be obedient to do it. Even if it doesn't seem to make sense, go ahead and obey God. 
And I tell you, it's, it's a joyful life whenever we just, just go ahead and obey the Lord and do what he asks us to do. So we go into Matthew, or Luke's gospel rather. So we go into Luke's gospel and we see Luke's account of the Christmas story. In Luke chapter 1 and verse number 26, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, the word angel means messenger. Messengers have messages. And so in this case, Gabriel, the angel of the Lord, has a message for Mary. Now, in this case, she saw the angel. Do you understand that God could bring an angel your way with a message, and you didn't see him, but the angel still was there to give you a message? I believe this. That sometimes people have said, you know, I believe the Lord told me to do this. The Lord put this in my heart. The Lord spoke to me to do this. And I believe sometimes it is the Lord by his spirit speaking to people. But who's to say it isn't an angel coming to you trying to get your attention? And, and you say, Pastor, do you have Bible for that? Well, do you have Bible against it? Amen. In this case, it says in the sixth month, the angel of the Lord was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. So remember, the Christmas story is about God Yahweh trying to reveal himself to mankind. Isn't it interesting? One of the great revelations God has for all of mankind is this. Hear this. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I was visited this summer by a gentleman from India, another part of India. and He's a pastor. He's roughly my age. And he, we spent some time fellowshipping together. And he said about a year ago, he was diagnosed with bladder cancer. And, you know, he said it just really just rocked his world. He was thinking, Lord, what in the world's going on here? And I said, well, through all of this, did the Lord talk to you? I mean, did the Lord tell you anything? And he said, you know, the Lord spoke to me two times real clear. Of course, he leads us every day, but two times it was just like real clear the Lord spoke to me. And he said one time when all of it was coming down and all this anxiousness about all this diagnosis and everything, I heard the Lord say to me, do not be afraid. And he said when I heard that, it was not only did the Lord give me that word, but from that moment on the fear just left me. I just knew. I know one thing, I'm not to be afraid no matter what happens. And then I said, well, did he say anything else? And he said, yeah. He said, I went to one of these hospitals in India where the, I mean, it was just wall-to-wall people and everybody was just crammed in. And, and he, said, he said, I just sat there and in that moment of desperation, I go, Lord, what am I doing here? And the Lord said, I'm going to show you the seriousness of this disease. In other words, you know, you're going through a season of your life and you're going to come out of this and you're going to realize just how many people's lives are affected by this disease of cancer. And, you know, he knew the Lord was, you know, in this case, allowing him just to see. Not that God brought the disease, but God in this storm invaded it to help him see just how serious this is. But I think it's interesting. He said, God gave me one word, do not be afraid. Did you know the word do not fear and do not be afraid. That's almost like one of these universal words that you need it virtually every day of your life. Give me an amen. I mean, when you deal with stuff and we want some word, and it's almost like it's the baseline word that none of the other words are going to work unless you get this word. And the number one word is do not be afraid. Well, I've discovered when people are afraid, you know, when kids are afraid, you know what they usually do? They usually cry, don't they? When people, adults are afraid, you know what we usually do? Usually have a long face. 
Well, the opposite of that is, is whenever we rebuke the spirit of fear and we come against that in the name of Jesus, there is a joy that's associated with that. So the Lord spoke to her, and this is the message. Remember, Yahweh, he's trying to reveal himself to mankind. And he said, greetings, you're a favored one. The Lord is with you. And then he went on to say, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, and he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who is called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So, there's a lot packed in here. But what is the revelation? What's God trying to reveal himself to mankind? In this case, to Mary. Mary, you have favor with God. Oh, I tell you, through the new birth, you know, each one of us can just wake up and say, Thank God we have favor with God. Yeah, we have favor with the Lord. Isn't that a beautiful thing to have, favor? Favor with the Lord. Have you ever needed favor? I remember one time years ago, I was a young pastor, and I, I preached a sunny morning. Man, I was on fire. I mean, the power of God was radiating through me. At least I thought it was. Anyway, I mean, I was preaching, and I was on fire, and and I pulled out of the parking lot, and I started driving down, driving down 39th, going to council. And I, I mean, I'm just driving. Well, I tell you, how many know you might have been on fire, but you still better keep it in the speed limit? <laughs> and I remember I was just, whoo, I was just, the presence of God was so real. And I was driving down the road. And next thing I knew, there was a, there was a highway patrolman behind me. I, how many know I went from heaven to earth real quick, you know? <laughs> And I remember I, I pulled over, and he was behind me, and, and I, I, you know, I just, I, I just thought to myself, oh, my Lord, you know, and, and then I, pulled, I said, officer, I apologize, you know, how, you know how we all, we're, we're, you know what we're doing, we're, we're needing a favor, correct, you know, we need a favor. So, officer, I apologize, I, I just, you know, honestly, I, you know, I was just coming from church, you know, and. And anyway, I, I can still remember he came back, and, and um, I said, well, officer, how much is this going to cost me when he finally came back to the car? And he said, well, it's a warning. This one's not going to cost you anything. I tell you, I'm still talking about that favor, and that's been a long time ago. <laughs> now, that's favor from an officer of the law. How many know, isn't it wonderful to have a favor from God Almighty? Have you ever been in a desperate situation? You know, Lord, I need a favor. I need you to show me favor on this thing. I need you to come through for me, Lord. And you know what he does? Time and time and time again, he comes through for us and he gives us a favor. You know what the message, the revelation that Lord is wanting to reveal to us during this holiday season? God's wanting us to know this is the year of the favor of God. Remember Luke 4, 18 in the Amplified when Jesus preached, Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Amplified summarizes it by saying this, it's the year where the free favors of God profusely abound. So there's a, there's a time of favor. Praise God. It's just good to be in favor with God. Isn't it good to be in favor with God? You know, I, I tell you, it's a good thing. I heard about this one preacher, and he said, I, I know I had a lot of favor with my teachers in school. He said, because you know what they'd do? They'd always pull their, my desk right up next to theirs. <laughs> he said, I just had a lot of favor with all my teachers. They, 
they just wanted me to sit right up next to the desk there. Well, you know, I, I tell you, we have the favor of God, and we may we kind of may cause a ruckus along the way, but God just pulls us right up close to Him and says, "You know, I, I love you like you are, but I love you too much to let you stay that way. I'm going to help you now. I'm going to help you." My rod and my staff is going to be a comfort to you but the staff was a corrective tool and god brings his correction into our life and uh, he cares about us so god is revealing himself to mankind through the christmas story and the revelation is that god wants us to know we have favor he wants ever he wants everybody to wake up tomorrow morning to know that they have favor with god You know, I, it's just a good thing. I got up early this morning. I was praying. I just pray, Lord, I just want to please you today. And I hear the Lord sometimes just say, you will. You know? Lord, I just want to honor you. You're going to. You know? And I'm just saying, we, we live uh, under the favor of God. It's a time when the free favors of God profusely abound. And so, you know, we just want to realize that's a great message that God has for us. And what did she say? Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be done according to your word. And the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste. This is verse 39. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country, to the town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. Somebody said, do you believe those children are alive? I believe they're not only alive. I believe that a child in the womb can feel joy. This child felt joy. I mean, John the Baptist, he had joy. He leaped in the womb. And Elizabeth was filled with joy. The Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the babe in my womb, he not only leaped, but he leaped for joy. I tell you, y'all, your words communicate they can communicate joy. You know, it doesn't say that Mary went over and laid her hands on Elizabeth's stomach. It doesn't say. It wasn't, you know, through the transmission of laying on of hands. That's not how this joy flowed. It was just the words. When the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Did you know your words, the sounds that your words make, when they go into the ears of people, they can bring joy into their life? Or they can also bring heaviness into people's lives. So what is this revelation that God's wanting to show? In this case, it, you know, it was a revelation of great joy. And blessed are you, uh, blessed is she, Verse 45, and blessed is she who believed that there will be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Now, I love this song of praise of Mary's, okay? My soul, Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. And behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm, and he has scattered the proud in their thoughts of their hearts, and he has brought down the almighty. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. Let me give you one final thing here I think is really special about this revelation. Actually, two things. One is the God revealed himself to the shepherds out in the field, the working class. You know, the ones that were out just taking care of responsibilities. 
God came in the clouds, these angels came, glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill towards men. And then I love where it talks about here about Simeon. And it says about Simeon, you know, that he was a man that God had revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death until he had seen the consolation of Israel. So, tonight, did you know God's trying to reveal himself to you? I know, here's what the human side is. Oh, I'm seeking the Lord, Pastor. So, do you think God's sitting there going, no, I'm not going to tell you. Or do you think he's the other way going, seek and you're going to find. Right? Knock and that door is going to open. Everyone who seeks finds. And so, you know, we've got to really get it into our heart. God, you're sending the information our way. Now, the problem many times, it's not on God's end, but it's on our side. Do you believe that? You know, not too long ago, we had a problem with our internet here at the church. Well, I called up the people, and I said, now, there's a problem. We got a problem, and I'm just, you know, I called them just confident. You guys are the problem, right? And then they run a little test, and they go, no, Mr. Arnold. Um, actually, everything tests out fine. It's flowing into the property there. We know that, you know, you're getting... The internet signal, what you need, you're getting it. And you know what I think we do sometimes? We're just confident. God, it's on you. And we just want to call him up and say, now you're not sending the signal. And he's going, "Uh, actually, I've checked everything flowing from heaven right into your, there's a blockage, but it's not on my end. How many realize that? But it's easy to kind of throw it off on God and to kind of put it off on him. So God is revealing himself to us. And I think it would be helpful. I think it would be really beneficial to all of us just to go through this this week just in a a, a clear way. Lord, thank you for revealing yourself. Quit saying stuff like, well, I just don't know what to do. I don't know what we're going to do. I know you mean well, but that's not helping you any, okay? You're reseeding the problem. Don't reseed the problem. Put some seeds of the answer in the ground. Lord, thank you in the name of Jesus. Fill me with the knowledge of what your will is and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Colossians 1.9. If you want a great prayer to pray on a, a routine basis, Colossians 1.9. Lord, fill me with the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And you say, Pastor, is it about these big things of life that God is wanting to talk to us about? Did you know God wants to talk to us not just about the big things, but he's he's concerned about the day-to-day things of our life. I think sometimes we think, well, it, it doesn't really matter. Well, if it matters to you, it matters to God. And he can get involved in just the things. So just open the door to him and, and help him to see, you know, what, what uh, help, I want you to see, rather, that God is concerned about those things that relate to your life and he's concerned about our children. Sometimes we get answers we don't want to hear. Have you ever had that happen? I remember one time our son, I'm going to wrap this up, our son Luke, we had this, we used to have this little deal on Sunday night called Parents Night Out, okay? And so we would have all the kids up here at the church and we'd let parents have like a date night or get away. And so we would do a Sunday night service, and it was really kind of a lot of fun, and we'd bless all the kids and have great services. And and our little son, Luke, he had this little purple uh, car, and he was pushing this purple car right down the aisle there uh, in the sanctuary, and he was pushing this car down the aisle, and he was about five years old, four or five years old. And he fell down, and his teeth, both of them, just, you know how your kids teach you to look like this? Well, they look like that. And I'm going, okay. And then, you know how as a parent, you just kind of push them back in place and pray in the name of Jesus. And so I called my brother up and I said, Forrest, what do you think I need to do? And he goes, well, Tom, sometimes you can just push them in place, you know. And I go, okay. Well, I prayed that night. And I, Sharon, I said, you know, Sharon and I are going, Lord, you know, this is our first child. And, you know, we're, you know how it is with a first child, you 
You want everything to be perfect. How many know number three? You just say, you know, you'll you'll live. Because <laughs> see, I was number three, you know. But anyway, uh, so I prayed. I said, God, I I just said, Lord, I was concerned about my little boy here. I said, Lord, is he gonna lose those teeth? I prayed that prayer in the middle of the night. And I'm telling you, I heard as clear as a bell from heaven. Yes. <laughs> and I remember the next day I said, Sharon, I asked the Lord, and he said he's going to lose it. And Sharon was going, okay, can you ask him again? Maybe, you know, you'd. but that was, you know, it was one of those deals where, sure enough, we went to the doctor, and they said, yeah, their roots are cracked. And, you know, and of course, they were just, the, they weren't the permanent teeth. But it was just like the Lord was just saying, hey, he's, you ask. And I still remember that, you know, I was thinking. And he, he made it fine. He, he, he eventually got those permanents. We were glad when those permanents came around. But I, I, I'm just saying, you say, Pastor, why you bring that up? You know, for me, that was a parent. That was like a bummer. I didn't want that to happen. But guess what? God cares about the stuff you care about. 10-4. Amen. Amen. Do I have to give another illustration or have I got it here? I got plenty of them. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I just pray, Father, that each one of us tonight, Lord, would realize you are Yahweh. You are the self-revealing one. That, Lord, you are trying desperately to reveal yourself to mankind. And, Lord, we realize sometimes people will make comments like, well, God's never shown himself to me, or God's not, you know, God's a mystery to me. But, Lord, as we see this Christmas story, it's just a picture of time and time again where whether it was wise men in a foreign country or whether it was Joseph or Mary or Elizabeth or Simeon, whether it was the shepherds, that, God, you were there just constantly wanting to reveal yourself to mankind and lord help us to see you are so eager to reveal yourself to mankind to this day lord to our lost neighbors to our lost co-workers to the people that are around us that are unsaved that lord you are desperately wanting to reveal yourself to them and, Lord, you want to use us to bring the knowledge of Jesus Christ to people, Father. And so, Lord, we just thank you tonight. All right, remember how I said God is trying to reveal himself to you in some areas? Would you just lift up your hand right now and just say, Thank you, Lord, I receive it in the name of Jesus. Come on. Just, Lord, I receive the knowledge of God in the name of Jesus. Lord, thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. We just receive, we declare that we're walking in supernatural revelation in these last days. God, you're going to show us things that Yahweh is revealing himself to us constantly. He's always trying to come into our world and come into our environment, Father. Lord, we recognize you. We just welcome you.